us. So welcome everyone to the Tory Birch Foundation Small Business Webinar Series. My name is Sahara Lake and I'm the Programs Manager with the Foundation and it's very good to be back with everyone today. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank our sponsor, Campaign Monitor, which is a global technology company that is focused on email marketing. They have made this entire series possible, and we just want to take a minute to thank them for their continued support. So today, I want to welcome our speaker, Louisa Joe, who is a leading entrepreneur, business coach, and investor who helps people start and scale their businesses, their online profitable businesses. And she helps thousands of students build their own businesses to six and seven figures, and her advice has been featured in numerous online and print publications, including but not limited to Forbes, Inc., Entrepreneur, and Business Insider. Um, and in case all of that wasn't impressive enough, before <laughs> all of this, Louisa was an international space engine, space station engineer, which we just chatted about. And so she is well-rounded and very qualified to speak with all of us today. <laughs> so excited to welcome her. Um, so Louisa, today we'll specifically be talking about how founders can create online courses that become tools for brand building and bringing in revenue. So after the presentation today, so after Louisa concludes her portion, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A. So please be sure to use the Q&A feature. So not the chat. The chat is for you all to continue to engage with each other. But any questions you want me to ask Louisa, please be sure to put in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as possible. And then when the webinar completely concludes, please keep an eye on your inbox for the replay link and the post webinar survey for you all to give us feedback. Um, and that really is what helps us develop new and better programming for you all. So appreciate you taking the time to do that. And so without further ado, Luisa, I wanna turn it over to you. Oh, amazing, thank you for that. Thank you for that intro. Guys, I'm just gonna share my screen or is my, no, my screen is already shared. Can you guys see my screen already? Not quite, Louisa. Okay, let me see. Um, in that case, where did I think my... if you hit share screen, you should be able to do that. Okay, let me see. Sorry, guys, we practiced this and then I don't know <laughs> what's no. going on now. Okay, there we Perfect. go. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump right in. Um, and then Louisa, do you wanna just hit play so it's full screen for us? Oh, you know what? I'm sharing here. Let me try this again, because it wasn't allowing, oh, I see it now. Um, for some reason it's not, oh, I think I figured out what happened. It wasn't allowing me to share my keynotes version. Oh, I see. So, oh, I found it. Okay, I think I had to exit. There we go. There you go. Yes. And then I think if you hit play. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Oh, amazing. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. All right, guys, I'm going to jump right in. I, I love seeing the energy in the chat and it's great to, to have you guys here. Thank you for that amazing intro. And let's, let's just get to it. We're going to talk about how to add courses as revenue stream to your business, pretty much no matter what kind of business you're in. And I'm really excited for this because I just, uh, I've seen what courses can do in terms of increasing your revenue, your engagement, um, just so much amazingness to your business, no matter what industry you're in. And so we're going to talk about that. I think the intro was pretty comprehensive, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think it's just important for you to note. I have been in this business for about eight years, right? So good amount of time, everything I'm going to be sharing with you is backed by actual experience and having worked at this point with thousands of clients to add courses to their businesses um, and for an additional five, six, and even seven figures and pretty much every industry you can think of. So that's the, the background of the information that I'm going to be sharing with you. I think also always important to note. Um, all right. So with that, let's start with talking about the benefits of a course and uh, what it can do for your product ecosystem and your business overall. Some of the benefits are really obvious, right? Adding another product, another revenue stream. Um, but there's also so much more as well. So the some, some of the reasons why I love courses so much are, for example, 
You can use a course to bring on an additional type or profile of client that maybe your current services don't address. It can also be used to increase your customer lifetime value by being something that is more of an introductory product for your clients. It can be something that is also used to boost the engagement of you or use of your actual product where you're teaching how to use your product better. It can also open you up to additional partners partnerships where maybe your existing products aren't a good fit for promotions, affiliate partnerships, or anything like that. And it can open you up to just a completely new way to grow your business in terms of uh, your audience and of course your sales. So I just kind of added, you know, listed out like four different ways that I see being used, uh, courses being used to really grow your business. And like I said, some of them are really obvious. Some of them might not be so. So I wanted to make sure that we cover that on top of the usual, you know, courses are really great for leveraging your time and your income and putting all your knowledge and information into one place so that you can increase and scale your revenue without having to directly increase the amount of time that it takes you to deliver on that. So that's the usual, but also lots of other great benefits to your business uh, to be thinking about as well. So with that, where we want to start is thinking about what offers you could leverage to add on to your business. And this does not have to be complicated. In fact, it should be really simple. So just trying to think of some of the, the businesses that I, that I saw in the chat at the beginning of uh, everyone's chat. So I'm just going to give some examples of the common types of uh, ways to add on a course, right? So one way, the most obvious is to basically whatever you do, if it is something that you do, like a service that you provide to put that into a course version. So um, for example, I saw a lot of like consulting businesses. So if your consulting is more done uh, for you or done with you, whatever it is that you help someone do teaching that and putting that into a course on its own, which can do two things. First, you know, if someone is not ready to buy your consulting, they can buy the course and get started on their own so that if they want your consulting, they can end up buying it down the road. Or the second way is what I just mentioned, where if someone wants to work with you, but they kind of want to get a feel for you before making that bigger investment in your consulting, the course can be a really great way to get to know you a little bit better before they do that. Um, there can also be an additional way where instead of teaching the whole thing that you consult on inside your services, you create a smaller package that maybe just teaches one bit as well. And then you create an entire product suite that, uh, shares the different aspects of the different things that you consult on. If you are in, for example, a product business you can teach something tangential to what it is that you are uh, selling. So I did see some product businesses. I'm not remembering any specific examples, but one example that's coming to mind is um, a past client of mine sold uh, crystals and, uh, you know, the crystals in terms of teaching energy healing and things like that. And so that was the, the product, but then the course was how to use those crystals and how to uh, separate courses, how to use those crystals, of course, about energy healing, things like that, so that they really complement each other really well, both either directly with the use of the product or something tangential related to the, the product. Product. And so it can be any of those. It can be common questions that you get from your clients, from your audience on things that you don't currently address right now, but could absolutely be addressing. And uh, it could be as comprehensive or as niche down into a particular area as you want. So there's a lot of room there for flexibility, but in terms of brainstorming the offers themselves, it really is that simple. It does not need to be any more complicated than that. And I really wanted to address that because I know a common question I see is like, okay, what ideas could I come up with for a course? The thing is, forget looking for ideas, right? It's really just about identifying the offers that, and like the way I broke it down, because those are really the most common categories and how they could fit into your business. So with that, there are a few things that as you're thinking through your offer, uh, I'm going to re really recommend that you think through. So the, the first thing I recommend that you think through is the result 
that someone is going to get from your course. A really common mistake that I see new course creators make is that they think about the value of their course and how they're going to create it in terms of the information that they're going to put into it. So the more information you can put into it, the more valuable it might be. And that is a really common misconception because of course we want to provide value, but why people buy a course is for some sort of results, whether it's to have the result of, you know, the, the thing you're teaching that you do as a service as well, right. Being able to do it for themselves or learning how to use that product or whatever that, that thing they want to learn to do and why they buy a course for. So really think through and with the, the examples that I just shared, what, why would someone be wanting to buy my course? And what is that thing aside from just information that my course is going to help them get to. That is really key. Um, when you're thinking about your offer, also be thinking about, okay, where does the support uh, or how much support do I want to offer for this product? So there's a whole range um, and it really depends on your business and what feels right to you. So on one end of the spectrum, there are basically courses where they're completely self-study, where someone buys the course, they get access to all the course content, and then they are on their own because they have everything they need within the course to study and learn it for themselves. Then there's, uh, um, well, let me go to the other end of the spectrum, which is that you buy the course and then you also get some group coaching with it. So maybe you get weekly calls with the creator or a program coach for a set amount of time, or you uh, have some so kind of support in between to be able to ask your questions and get them answered. Or maybe you even have a personal one-on-one -on -one coach that guides you through the program, right? Those are all common options. Um, and then the hybrid with like the, the sweet spot between those two is to have a self-study course, but then also offer some sort of support forum or group like common is a Facebook group or a Slack community where you have someone, maybe you or a program coach, again, answering the question so that people are mainly going through the course on their own. Uh, but if they have any questions and they need a little bit more clarification and they just want to feel a little bit more supported, they can go ahead and get that. All of these work. I have done all of these. I think there are pros and cons to all of them. I've enjoyed them equally in different times and phases of my business. Uh, but really where you want to start is up to you and where you are currently in your business and you know how much resources you have to allocate to this. And of course, the more support you provide, the more you can charge as well. And so those are all things to take into account. Um, courses that are self-study, it depends on your industry and the course and how they're uncomprehensive it is. They can range anywhere from a few hundred dollars to about a thousand to two thousand dollars. The, the hybrid course support that I mentioned falls into the same range. And then courses that have a lot more support can range anywhere from a few hundred dollars to five figures. So there's a really big range and it's more about kind of knowing your industry and the kind of product you're offering, but wanted to give you at least somewhat of an idea of what the difference might be. And then the final thing to think through when you're thinking through your offer. So we talked about, you know, what the course could be itself, the results, the support, and a little bit about the pricing. The final piece is, of course, where it fits into your business, because this is key. Like I know so many of you have your existing businesses. It really has to when you add a course, it really has to be done in a way that fits into everything that you already have. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, but ideally you want it to be that way. And so that's why you want to be thinking about, and that's why I shared the different ways just a few minutes ago, a product, a course can fit into your current product lineup, right? Is it going to be something that is just a completely different type of product that you add on to round out your product suite? Is it going to be something where the goal eventually is to have people get to trust you a little bit? and then upsell into your services where that's the main thing that you want to sell? Is it to help people be able to get to a point where they're better and 
able to use your products. We're more excited to use your products so that you make more product sales, right? And so, or is it just that you want to have a separate suite of educational products with your courses that you're doing as a separate branch of your business? So again, those are the most common ways. And thinking through that initially can just take a few minutes, but it will really help you line up thinking about, okay, do I just want one course? Do I want a product suite? What am I going to do for the pricing and the support? And how am I going to line it up so that it helps boost all of my business versus just being a standalone product that, you know, makes some sales. So those are the key things to really make sure that you think through in terms of laying out the foundation for your course does not have to be complicated, but those are the the key things. So with that, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the things that you need technically to be able to start selling courses. So first you of course need your product and that includes the course, right? With modules, lessons, recordings, worksheets, the support, all of that. And um, the most common options for doing this are to host it on some sort of course platform. A really common one is Teachable, for example, uh, or to host it on your own self-created course platform, which takes a lot more time and money. And I don't recommend unless you're committed to creating an entire product suite and really adding that as a main way of driving revenue in your business. Initially, you can also host it as documents in a Facebook group to sell your first course as well. So it doesn't need to start out being complicated, but you do need the product. Um, you also need the things that are going to help you sell it. So your sales assets, you're going to need a sales page. It can be really simple. Um, if you're going to sell something higher end and you already have a consulting business where you already do sales calls to drive those sales, it could be as simple as, okay, I'm going to skip the sales page for now. I'm going to drive some sales calls because I've already got that system and that team set up in place. And we're going to sell some courses using that same methodology. And then we'll go back and sell the sales pages or set up the sales page pages, the, the emails, the posts later on, but sooner or later, you're going to want that to be able to sell your course. Then you're going to need the payment processing. So order forms, uh, whether that is through something as simple as PayPal, or if you are wanting to set it up and really streamline it, uh, you know, common options are, for example, SamCart, uh, which is a standalone order form software, or maybe you already have your own existing order form software that you can use as well, but you don't want to be sending invoices or anything like that, um, which is a keynote here. And then, of course, how are you going to deliver it, right? Where are you going to host the course? What kind of access are people going to have? What kind of support are they going to have? Uh, what is your team going to look like to be able to support that? So those are the things to really think through and uh, make sure that you have in place so that you are ready to sell. So it doesn't have to be complicated again, but those are the key things. All right, so with that, let's spend a little bit of time talking about how to create the best course. So um, what I'm going to share with you is the result of basically myself having created at this point, I think over 20 courses just for my business alone. And the, the things I'm going to share are not that complicated. Some of them are a little bit counterintuitive. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about them. So the, the first thing is, again, as we mentioned, it is all about the result. I cannot emphasize this enough because it, like, it seems obvious when we're talking about it, but then you know, you'd be surprised how many people forget about it, go off and create a course because they love teaching what it is that they want to teach. And then they come back and they're like, oh, wait, I created this really comprehensive, amazing course. I don't understand why it's not selling as well as it could be because it's not focused so much on the result as on here's all this amazing information. And so again, the first thing you want to start with when brainstorming your offer is what is the thing that someone is going to get from going through this course? It's not going to be because they, you know, just want to buy a course and they're so excited to learn. I mean, you know, that might be, might be part of it, but the biggest driver for your busy clients, because all of our customers are busy is what am I going to get from going through this? And is this course going to be able to help me do that in a way that works for me, my schedule, my concerns, my fears, and my doubts, right? So it can be in one sentence, really what the result is. And it really most of the time should be able to be summed up that way. Um, so the next thing is as you're creating your course, once you know the results, how I like to think about it is I like to then reverse engineer what you actually put into your course. 
And how I like to think about that is depending on the type of course you're creating, if you're creating a course that addresses just one, you know, aspect of whatever it is that you can teach, uh, what I call like a first step or a kind of key category course, instead of like the whole, you know, A to Z process, if that's applicable to you then it can be just a few modules. Ideally, for the majority of your courses, you wouldn't want to be going over too much like four to five modules. Um, and so if you have a more comprehensive course, then yes, you might go over a little bit. Um, but even then, for example, for my flagship courses, I have them about five to six modules. Now within each module, there are sub lessons or sub modules. So each big module will have like three sub modules with, you know, just a few video lessons in each one. But even that way, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. There are a few exceptions, but especially for your first few courses, we don't, you know, those aren't really applicable. And so when you're thinking about that, knowing that, okay, let's say I'm going to break it into four or five modules, or at the most, if I'm, you know, doing like a weekly live program, that's eight weeks long, I'm going to break it into eight modules. That's the one of the exceptions that is actually applicable. Then what are the four to five or eight or however many number of modules you're going to have key milestones that someone needs to get done to be able to get to the result? That's what I mean when I say reverse engineer, right? So let's say you help someone, um, you thinking about the, the consulting uh, businesses that I saw in the beginning of the chat, you help someone grow their business, right? I think I saw a few business consultants. And so the first piece is you identify like, so, okay, at the end of, you know, our business consulting course, you are going to have increased your revenue by 30% totally making stuff up just to give you an example, but let's go with that. So the first thing we do is we need to identify your current business model and see if there's room for improvement, right? So maybe that's module one. Um, and so by the end of module one, you will have identified the gaps in your business model that you can improve. So that's an example of how you reverse engineer. And then the second step that we need to do is we need to um, identify the low hanging fruit in terms of your existing offers, right? Is there um, traffic that is already coming to you that you can easily scale? Um, that could be a module in of itself, right? At the end of that, you've scaled your existing traffic sources more to boost your low hanging fruit. Um, module three could be looking at your existing products and boosting your existing uh, prices or your profitability or sales for those existing products. I think that gives you enough of an idea. I don't want to like go into teaching like, you know, on a, on a tangent, but basically you can see how it's really broken down into probably the same steps if you're a consultant that you're doing with a very big focus on the results versus the information. Like I'm, notice how I didn't say like module one, I'm going to teach you how to uh, understand what a business model is or the theory of a business model, right? So it's shifting from theory because we're not a teaching a college course is not a textbook to the application and even beyond that, the actual result that someone's going to get. So it's um, a blend of information and application. And so we're using that to reverse engineer all your um, all your modules is what I found to be the best way to be really organized, to have people stay focused on the engage with your course. And, you know, there is, as a really important side note, a key issue that a lot of course creators struggle with is engagement and follow through on their courses for their students. So a lot of people will buy a course, be excited for it, and then drop off. And one of the reasons is there are two really big reasons. One is because they lose their steam and motivation because they're not seeing results fast enough. And so when you address it so that every module, even every lesson within the module, right? So the same way we just broke out the modules, you can break out, okay, to you know get that person that result in that first module, what do I need in the video lessons or the lessons within that module? And each lesson should have a result that moves that person closer. When you do it that way, every single lesson will have a win for the uh, person taking the course so that they are literally seeing the results and they are building their motivation that this works, that they want to continue. And 
there have been a lot of studies on this in terms of teaching and learning that ideally you want to give someone a win or like a, what feels like a win within about like five to 10 minutes of each five to 10 minutes of your video lessons. So it could be like an aha, it could be go off and do this thing. And then of course you want to just build that philosophy throughout all of your course. So that, um, even outside of the video lessons with what people are doing, every single thing they do is something that moves them forward. So that is the reverse engineering piece, which is again, key. Now, the other, the final piece that I wanna put here, and this is the other main reason why courses have a bad, a lot of courses have a bad rap for um, like low follow through and low engagement, is because they have too much information. And again, this comes from a good place. We all wanna give value. And we have been taught that the more information we give, the more valuable it is. But in courses, the reverse is true. The way I think about it is this. What is the least amount of information that I can give to someone in a course to be able to help them get the results that they want? Anything extra, I take out. And this is really important because when you shift to focusing on the results, right, that's what people are buying for, it, everything becomes about the results. And so with that, it's not about how much information you give. And again, this is a really common mistake because I see so many course creators promoting on their course pages, hey, the reason you should buy this course is because we have 40 plus hours of content. We have like 100 plus worksheets and so on and so forth. And that is actually overwhelming to people because how many people have time or desire to go through all of that to get to it? In fact, the faster the less work I have to do to get to a result, the more valuable that method is to me. And so when you think about creating your course, I would recommend having the same thing. Okay, what's the result? What exactly is needed to get this result? No more and no less, of course, right? And so a lot of my courses with this in mind, um, I've been able to get a lot of the video lessons down to just like five to 10 minutes because every word, right? The, I script out the majority of my lessons for the majority of my courses and every word we, I go over and I ask, okay, is this needed or not? And time and time again, the feedback I've gotten is from, from clients, my gosh, I'm so glad this course is so different, right? You've explained in five to 10 minutes what it's taken other videos, 40 minutes to do, and this is what I needed. And so it really is about shifting our own idea of what is valuable and then doing the additional work because it's actually easier to just kind of talk and share a lot of information versus thinking about, okay, what exactly do I need to put that is going to force me to be concise so I'm respecting the student's time as well so that they can get the best results in the least amount of time. So those are the three key points for how to create the best course. The rest, like trust yourself. You already know the thing it is that you're teaching. And if you focus on these three uh, bullets, then you are going to create a really great course from the beginning. So with that, I want to spend the rest of today talking about selling your course, because once you have a great offer, you understand where it fits into your business, you are creating a great course you want to make some sales. And so the way that I always recommend a new course creator or someone new to selling courses sell is through what I call a challenge, um, and, or a launch. And we're going to talk about a challenge launch specifically, but, uh, a launch, um, high level. And basically the way to think about a launch is the, uh, course equivalent of a movie release. And the reason why I say this specifically is because there's a lot of information out there that to sell a course, you just put up a sales page, you just send some emails, write some social media posts, and you can just expect to see the sales rolling in. So that is true. If you have a massive audience, they're very engaged, and you have very good sales, marketing, and copywriting skills, which, you know, is a lot uh, for, for a new course creator. Even if you already have an existing business, there's no guarantee that you have all of those skills unique to specifically for selling courses, not to mention the fact that your audience might be completely new to buying courses from you, and so it's a new relationship, and so it takes a little bit extra time and kind of training to shift that relationship and let your audience know that buying courses from you is just as good as buying your other products. And so with all of this, you want to put in a little bit more effort initially to be able to sell your course well. And that's where a launch comes in. 
So um, before we talk about the type of launch that I recommend and my best tips for that, I want to break out kind of the different launch stages as well that I have seen. So the first launch stage, which is technically not so much a launch stage, but a more kind of optional add-on if you already have an existing business and you know, you're busy, you don't have time to do a full challenge launch and you want to just get going and add a course is what I call the minimal effort launch. And the minimal effort launch is basically where, um, to use the consulting example that we touched on earlier, if you already are selling and you've got a sales system, you've already got clients, and you know there's some people who have wanted to hire you for consulting, but they haven't been a good fit for you in the past, where you might reach out to them and say, hey, I've got this new offer for you and I um, would love to talk to you about it. Do you want to hop on a sales call or whatever your existing sales system is? So you can leverage your existing processes to make a sale. That's why I say minimal effort. Um, so you don't have to build out a whole set of marketing and sales processes for a new product. And so you might do that. And then you might say, hey, all right, we're going to do an introductory group and you're going to get an introductory price. If you're interested in it, let me know. And if you are, here's the payment. Uh, order form and you'll be in, right? So really minimal effort building on your existing audience and client relationships. And really you can do this even if you don't have a consulting business. I actually remember a while back, I don't know if any of you guys use uh, Groove for customer support. We, we do, and they are a great um, software, but that aside, um, the something I noticed that they did a few years ago that was really smart was what they had done was they had used content marketing to really build their audience base and uh, specifically their blog to do that. And so I, I believe this was a few years ago, they basically sent out an email to their email list, which was pretty substantial and said, hey, you know, we are a software company, but you know, blogging turned our business around. And, you know, we've gotten to a point where we're doing six figures a month in recurring revenue. And so if you're interested in that and learning how we did it, we want to roll out in a course to teach you how to do that. If you're interested, right, hit reply and let us know and we'll give you the details. So because they did it that way, they didn't have to do a big launch. They um, use their existing processes. They had their customer support team probably just respond with details about the program and people who are really interested and engaged with them because they love their software, their product, right? Uh, were interested in learning about this tangential thing that they could help them with and people bought. And I'm pretty sure that that first course sold out because of that. So if you sell some sort of product and you're wanting to roll out a course, like we talked about earlier, that offers something tangential to what you do or related to your product, then that could be a really easy way to do that. So that's what I mean by the minimal effort launch. The key is that's not going to maximize your revenue because you're going to miss out a lot on a lot of people who maybe aren't paying attention to your content, your emails, your social media posts, who might have wanted a little bit more information, but if you have like a, enough of an audience size, you're positioning your offer well, it could give you more than enough sales to start uh, getting that first cohort in. So you're making sales, you're creating testimonials and you're underway, right? So if that sounds like a fit, then that is the place to start. Now, once you have that under your belt, or if you're like, you know what, I have a bit more resources, I want to scale my courses a bit more, then the first stage, the first actual stage is what I call the no list or no experience launch, where either you don't have a big list because your business to date has been word of mouth, or you have no launch and course experience. And what that is, is I usually say set a goal of make me, depending on where your business is, but making around 10 sales or so, maybe five, maybe 10 around there. Um, again, if you have a really big audience, then, you know, you can adjust that number accordingly to so that you are you know bringing in a good amount of revenue but it's not so big that you are setting a goal that you can't really realize and it's enough for you to make sales to do the whole methodology that we're going to talk through and get it under your belt basically to get it under your belt to have some sales and to kind of figure out the basics so be like 
That's the no list, no experience launch. Then once you have that, because every launch, essentially the strategy is the same, but you dial in the specifics, right? So once you have the, the first stage under your belt, your second launch might be a dial in launch where you're like, okay, I know the methodology I'm going to use. I have all my sales assets. I know what works, what doesn't. Okay. I'm going to do more of what I saw work last time. I'm going to tweak and test some more of what didn't work last time and see if I can't dial it in a bit more. So it usually takes a handful of launches to go but from um, no list or no experience to really dialing it in. And then the final stage is the scale up launch where you take everything that worked and then you scale it up with a lot more traffic, especially with, for example, affiliate partners with maybe paid advertising or PR or whatever other traffic sources that you prefer to use. So the range for these launches can vary a lot, right? So I'm going to give you some examples of ranges of what I've seen, but keep in mind, again, these can vary a lot. So for the no list slash no experience launch, and I'm going to group the minimal effort launch in there, although it might be a little bit lower. I usually see um, somewhere under like uh, between four to five figures in sales, very low five figures, um, four, four to five figures, right? So that is bringing you in some sales. You are laying the foundation. It's also not so many clients that maybe you break something in your customer support and aren't able to deliver because it also takes time to figure out your support with which way you're going to offer and how you're going to offer it with the different options that we talked through earlier. With the dial-in launch, usually I see that at about five to six figures per launch. The majority fall into like low five figures, so maybe thirty to fifty thousand dollar launches, right? Which is still pretty sweet. If you do one of those a quarter, that can be a good boost to your revenue for sure. And then scale-up launch, I mean, sky's the limit, right? So for my own scale-up launches, I don't like. Um, I've never used affiliates, but when I was doing a lot of those, we would do close to about eight hundred thousand to a million per scale up launch. And I know we could have scaled it up more. I know there are a lot of people who do. And so again, sky's the, the limit for that. So those are the different launch stages to think about so that you're kind of going in knowing it's the same methodology, but there are things that you're going to be tweaking. Okay, so with that, we already talked about the minimal effort launch. I forgot this was a whole slide on its own. So we already covered that and we can move on. Um, so we talked about the other launch stages as well. So again, we covered that. I'm just so excited to tell you guys about it. I forgot about the slides. Um, and then with that, so the thing I hinted at earlier is specific to launching. There are different strategies for launching. So if you are familiar with any of them, they're the common ones are are, for example, like the product launch formula, which was created by Jeff Walker. And it's a series of videos that leads into a card open and enrollment period for your product. Um, I have found that unless you have a massive audience and are really good at your marketing and your sales and all of those skills that we talked about earlier, it leaves a lot of money on the table, right? So it works really well, but there are other ways to uh, do this even better. And so we're, we don't need to go into all of the other ways. I want to focus in our time left on the specific way that I recommend that I have seen do the best for if you have a relatively small audience, if you want to maximize engagement, you want to get the most sales possible. And what also happens is when you do a challenge launch, like we're going to talk about, it really boosts your engagement with your audience so that the ripple effect from that can, I mean, there are so many ways it could go. It could be someone sees your challenge, loves seeing more of you. They hire you for your consulting or they buy more of your product or they reach out and want to do some sort of partnership. I mean, I've seen all types of results from a challenge launch done well. So what exactly is a challenge launch? It's very simple. It's basically just like, you know, for a movie, how before the movie actually comes out, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens, right? It, you've got like the main actors doing a whole bunch of interviews. You see trailers being dropped at periodic intervals. And then there's the big movie premiere that is the opening night of the, uh, the movie dropping. And then you've got the movie running in theaters, or it used to be, but we'll go with the old model, the movie running in theaters for a while so that 
um, people had time to see it before it went to DVD or streaming. So a challenge launch is a course version of that very condensed. Don't worry. It's not nearly as much work, but really what it is, is it helps you do a lot of those things, gets people attention, gets people excited for your product using a strategic series of daily challenges. And these challenges are basically mini prompts that have someone going off and doing a mini challenge that only takes five to 10 minutes, but is very strategically done so that it boosts engagement and desire and interest in your um, product. So that keyword is strategic. What I want to cover now in our time left is three of the top things that your challenge definitely needs to address in your prompts to cover three of the top reasons that people don't make as many sales as they could. So the first reason is, you know, a lot of course creators when they're starting out are afraid that they're not going to make the sales that they want to make because of, I mean, I think it's a fear so many of us have, right? Roll out a new product people might not buy. And so the number one reason, or one of the things you want to absolutely make sure you address with your challenge is a potential client thinking, why should I want this course? Right? So a challenge is really good at doing that. And the reason why it is, is because people actually want to buy. Now they want to buy if they believe that your solution will help them. So what it is, is that people are buyers. I absolutely believe that, right? However, um, they want to buy if, and they want their problem solved. So this ties back into what we were talking about. If you're very clear on the results that your course provides, and you know what that is, then what your challenge is going to do is going to help them create that belief that your course is going to be able to help them solve that problem and get that result. So how are they going to do that? How is the challenge going to do that? You're going to give them step zero wins. So a step zero win is something that someone needs to believe or see or have, someone being an ideal client, before they can believe that you can actually help them get the result via your, your paid product, your course. So an example of a step zero win is I'm just thinking through, like, um, I help a lot of career coaches and consultants, right? So a challenge of a step zero win is they'll see a lot of their ideal clients who want a new job don't believe that they can, they have the credentials to get their dream job. And so step zero win is actually having the confidence and seeing, wow, I do have the things I need to be able to get that job. And so one of the ways that we did that, that was really creative was one of the day's challenges was to have someone go out and ask their LinkedIn contacts to endorse them on LinkedIn. It not only gave them a tangible result, but also boosted their confidence to believe, whoa, I have way more you know, to offer than I thought I did. And okay, I can see how that would lead me to be able to get my dream job. So yes, I want this product that's going to help me do that because this person is the person who helped me boost my confidence. So that's one example of that. The second question you want to make sure you address through your challenge prompts, and the, I, I want to mention the challenge is usually anywhere from five to 10 days, depending on the, the scale and price of your product. So keep it at five to 10 daily strategic prompts. Okay, so the second thing you want to address is why is the course um, worth whatever price you're charging, no matter what price you charge? Someone is going to be wondering that. And so with that, um, the, the question or the story I always like to share is a quick story about this guy, if you don't recognize him, which I didn't before I found this picture, this is Picasso. And so there's a story that, um, you know, once a woman went up to Picasso at a restaurant and asked him to draw her something. And so he took out a napkin, he drew something in just like a minute or two. And then he said, okay, here you go. Um, and the woman said, okay, great. How, how much is it? And he said, it's going to be $20,000. And the woman said, what, why is this $20,000? It only took you a minute or two to draw it. And he said, no, it took me 40 years of my life to be able to draw it for you in two minutes. And so the reason why the story is so powerful is because it's true for all of us, right? What's in the course is not just what's in the course. It's all the time, the effort, the money, maybe yourself needed to be able to do that. And if Picasso had to teach his clients that, we all have to too. So your clients might not necessarily know that. And so what I like to do is I like to have prompts in the challenge that teach the gap of what it takes to um, go from where they are to where they want to be and all of the things that they might have to go through or that you had to go through to be able to help them so that they understand how much of a shortcut your course is and thus what the value is. 
So I'm going to wrap up really quickly with the last um, question that your challenge absolutely wants to address or needs or should address, which is, is this person, aka you, the person selling the course, actually credible, right? And so um, what, oh, hold on, yeah, okay, so the best way to do that is through personal trust, right? You can talk about your credentials all day long, and of course, that's helpful, but to build real trust, the best way to do that is through um, actually talking to people, having them uh, share their challenge answers in maybe a Facebook group where you're engaging with them. You're doing live streams every day that add on to what you're teaching in your prompt and letting people see that you know what you're talking about. You're doing live demonstrations of you answering questions and really understanding people's names and really having that personal connection that frankly nothing else can substitute. So that, that's another reason why a challenge is such a great way to, to do that, because nothing else can do that, like a video series, a webinar alone, nothing else can do that. Now, the last thing I want to know really quickly before we wrap up is a really fun story of Guardians of the Galaxy. So if you are not into comics, which I am not, but I love marketing, as you can probably tell, Guardians of the Galaxy was the first Marvel movie where the comic didn't have a big fan base because apparently the, the comics are not so good. And so it was a risk for Marvel to be releasing this movie because it didn't have an inbuilt fan base unlike the other previous movies. And so what they did was through, they did something really smart, which is through promoting the movie, um, they built up the audience fan base, right? They really built up the story, the heroes, the reasons why we should love it. Um, and they really did that through the entire promotion launch up to the movie. So that the, the, the day the you know movie theaters opened, people were like really excited to uh, watch the movie. And this principle is really key because the last note I want to share with you why a challenge is so great is that a well-planned challenge launch should do the same. I've had past clients use um, the fact that they were doing a challenge to go out there and get PR and get more people for it, use affiliates to promote the challenge because people know challenges you know, uh, convert really well and drive more sales, use it to boost their own engagement with their audience, run ads to it because again, challenges convert better. And so use the challenge itself to grow your audience and boost your sales. This works better at the dial-in and scale-up launch stages, but that's absolutely something to keep in mind so that you're not limited to your existing audience size before a launch to determine how many sales you're going to make. Use it as a chance to actually grow your audience. Okay, so with that, I know we're just a few minutes over, but I really wanted to make sure we covered everything and hope you guys found that helpful. Um, thanks so much, guys, for, for being here and uh, participating in all of that. Thank you so much, Louisa. That was awesome. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in via the Q&A, also a few questions that people um, submitted beforehand. So I want to ask a few of them in our last few minutes here. Um, the first one, Louisa, is around your recommendation for an online platform. So what should folks look for when they're choosing an online platform to ho host these courses? And then um, the question, are there any specific platforms that you would recommend? Yeah, so really quickly, um, honestly, all of the platforms, most of them are really good. It's just what feels easiest to you to use. The reason why I recommend Teachable is because I've tried all of them. These days I host my own um, to be you know, completely transparent, but it just costs so much money to do it. It's not worth it initially. And I just always found Teachable to be by far the easiest to use. That's great. And then in general, what about Teachable is so great? Like what? Yeah, so setting up your course, uploading things, the organizational structure of the modules, right? It just makes sense where it's like, it's really easily laid out. You go in, you upload your stuff, you're done. <laughs> Amazing. That's great. Um, someone asked, are there any tips, would any of the tips you gave today change if you're teaching a live course versus recording yourself? In terms of selling, no. Right. So um, the only thing is thinking more about the delivery, right, Del dripping out the pr um, program live. Uh, you might you probably don't need something like Teachable. If you're doing a live, you could just deliver on Zoom and then use a Facebook group or a Slack channel. But aside from that, everything else applies. That's great. Um, this, this is a really good question that came in beforehand. Um, how can a business owner decide if they should make a course geared towards their customers 
or professionals in their industry? Are there pros and cons to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really good question. So ultimately it boils down to um, the key we talked about earlier. Where do you see it fitting in into your business, right? If you're wanting to help professionals in your industry, so maybe help other people do what you do, is that because it's an additional product, entire suite and, you know, strategy that you want to add on down the road? Um, Or like, if that's not the case, why are you thinking you need to do a course and where is it going to go? Um, otherwise, I would recommend it for your existing customers because chances are pretty good. You've got a lot more customers that you, you know, potential customers who aren't your customers yet. And it's better to scale what you already have right now versus trying to start a whole new thing where you have to build out your credentials, learn how to market to a whole new audience and, you know, start from scratch. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Um, Abigail in the Q&A asked, um, at what point should you create an entity for an online course businesses? Should you wait until you're profitable? Oh, okay. So this is tough. I always have to caveat. This is not legal advice. Right. From a business perspective, my point of view is... (laughs) always wait until you're profitable, right? Because all of that, yes, is important, but especially with courses, it's yes, transformational, but it's not like, you know, super high risk. We're not doing like surgery or something. So focus on, you know, the business part, getting profitable first, and then take care of the legal stuff as soon as you can. Totally. Um, a question from Brittany. If we were to bring on talent to help build this type of programming for our company, what should be in the job description and what would the position really be? Yeah. So if you're going to bring on someone to create your course for you, you want someone who not only has experience in the thing that they're going to be helping you teach, but also in actually teaching because they're two totally different skill sets. And so you probably want someone, or you might want two people, one who is the talent, right? One who has like the product or teaching experience themselves and have them work hand in hand. You probably don't need a full-time role for this. There are companies that specifically do this. And so it might be better to look for someone like that or a contractor who can do this part-time, but those are the two main things I would be looking for. Yeah, that's great. Um, I see a question coming in here. Um, When you think about the legal, and I know your disclaimer around the legal side, but when you're thinking about the legal side of all of this, what type of legal disclosures should you typically include? There are so many, Yeah. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you are creating the the regular disclaimers. If it's not medical, it's not, you know, financial, it's not all of that advice. You want to have disclaimers that you can't guarantee results um, and uh, that customer testimonial results are not guaranteed for other people. I think those are the main one privacy guarantees. Um, So what I would do is actually, you know, I would just recommend checking out the lawyer I go to for my contracts. Her name's Lisa Fraley. Uh, you can just Google her. She has so much like information on her blog, on her podcast about this. <laughs> Let me just send you to her. Yeah. Can you say her name for us one more time? Yeah. Lisa Fraley, F-R-A-L-E-Y. Amazing. That's a great, that's a great resource for everyone. Um, another question that came in beforehand. Um, what are your thoughts on setting a time limit for a course to be available? Um, so available for purchase. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Um, that's a whole a key principle of the challenge launch and like movie releases, right? There's only so much time right. you can go see them in the movie theater. And the reason is because no matter how great your product is, most of the time, a lot of us are procrastinators, right? Like at the end of a launch, literally you might see 50 to 70% of the sales come in in the last 48 hours again and again. And so give people a reason to give people a reason to buy and absolutely have open and closed enrollment. That's good. That's a good one. A few more questions. People are, people are coming in hot with the questions now that we're, <laughs> they've had a little bit of time to process. Um, Faye asked, can you share any resources for creating digital content? So like the graphics or like animation, things like that. Yeah. So honestly, I, I use a designer, um, yeah. but Canva, Canva's the, the best place to go to for free. Right. So that's, that's my recommendation. Totally. Um, reading here. Um, Gloria is asking, what is the optimal amount of time to teach per module for a live course? I think, the, I mean, I can almost answer this thinking about the format we've been using for the webinar, but curious, Louisa, what you recommend? I agree. If you're doing it live and everyone is sitting down, that is different from watching videos. So like an hour is a good amount of time for both teaching and Q&A. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I would, I would double that. Gloria, think about the experience that you're having right now. You want to have 
enough time to get the information out there, but then give people time to process and give people time to ask questions as well. Um, another question, how do you protect your intellectual property when developing a course? Yeah. So the truth is, right. You can do your best. You can legally protect it. You can have all that, which I definitely do, but there are literally a huge industries and companies out there that specifically pirate it. And so there are services that you can use to protect your, um, your course content where literally all they do is they go and they take down those things and, you know, pursue legal, uh, legal avenues to protect your property for you. Totally. Do you have any that you would recommend? I do. So the company I use is called Takedown SAR, C-Z-A-R, uh, and then Takedown. And they are really good at it. That being said, I do want to caveat. I think in the beginning, honestly, don't worry too much about that. Like you have to have a certain level of sales before those companies often are paying attention to you anyways, you know, and like your best customers, they want you, they want the full support. They're Most of them are not going to go by the pirated version. Yeah. I think that's great. Um, and Louisa, last question that I'd like to just ask all of our speakers, if there is one thing that you want people to take away from your presentation today, what would that be? Okay, I would say do it ugly. Nobody ever feels ready to sell a course. I definitely didn't. I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much to do. And that's why I included the minimal effort option. Mm -hmm. If you already have, you know, those customers and you want to do this, set a date like, okay, next quarter or whenever I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. Even if I make one sale, that's going to be a win. I'm going to deliver the heck out of it. I'm going to have it done under my belt. And then I'll do the other launch stages from there. I think that's, that's great advice. Not even just for this, just in general.